Ponzi logics of accumulation in post-socialist uh, Albania. Uh, and it's a great pleasure uh, to welcome its author, uh, Professor uh, Smaki Musarai, um, back here to the Harriman Institute. Um, she used to frequent some of our events when she lived here in New York. So it's a pleasure to welcome her back. Um, this is a really extraordinary tale. I think <laughs> one of the most, I think illuminating and also, I mean, initially to my sensibility, bizarre, um, but I think uh, the logics of it are really well laid out um, that yes, this really did happen and how did it happen? Um, so it's it's actually the, the article version I teach in Legacies as to one of the features of the political economy of transition um, in Albania. And we're incredibly lucky uh, to have uh, Professor uh, Musarai, who is an associate professor of anthropology and director at the Center for Law, Justice, and Culture at Ohio University. And her research focuses on the anthropology of money and value, informal economies, speculist, uh, speculative bubbles, corruption, and post-communist uh, transformation. And she continues to be engaged in projects um, both within the region and outside. So uh, today the format is as follows. We'll get about um, a 30-minute uh, overview of the book and its major arguments and some of its very uh, colorful anecdotes um, from Professor Musarai. Then I'll ask her a couple of follow-up questions and then uh, let's uh, get your questions too. Please use the Q&A function. Um, uh, that you will find uh, on the Zoom in this seminar. Uh, and also, um, if you have uh, uh, any uh, uh, questions about the origins of the project or, or what this links up to, uh, please feel free to, to ask those as well. Um, as well. So uh, once again, uh, welcome. And Professor Musarai, uh, congratulations. This is... <laughs> You know, really, it's really impressive and it's really fascinating. And we're, you know, we're so happy that you're here to, to tell the tale for us. Thank you so much, Alex. And thank you to the Harriman Institute for hosting me. It, it's a big honor. As you mentioned, I was a student in New York um, uh, almost a decade ago. Um, yeah, a decade ago at the new school, but I lived nearby at the I house where a lot of other graduate students and postdocs from um, affiliated with Harriman Institute and other schools uh, at Columbia University uh, were my co-residents. So I have this very fond memories and this sort of personal connection to the center. So I'm going to um, share my screen. I will be um, using a presentation. It's easier to keep me on track with the time. Um, and, and I will also be reading my presentation so that, again, so that we can stay on, on track. And, and what I will uh, be doing is I will be sort of giving an, an overview and I will use a couple of uh, examples for my book to talk about how I did this research uh, and especially how we do uh, anthropology of a Ponzi scheme. So um, my book is based on ethnographic and archival research. The bulk of this research took place in 2008, 2009, uh, but I also continued to return to, to collect more archival material um, and, and followed up with some of my interviewees, my informants in summers 2015 and 17 when I was rewriting and revising the, what was my dissertation into the book. Um, Tales from Alvarado revisits time of excitement and loss in late um, 90s Albania. This was a time of deep political and economic transformations that followed the end of the Cold War, the collapse of one of the harshest uh, communist regime in Eastern Europe. It was a time of excitement for people in Albania who felt free after decades of dictatorship. It was also a time of disappointment. Many Albanians yearned to go West, to European countries and to the United States. Uh, as they tried to do so, they ran into long waits and the closed doors of embassies and a forbidding visa regime. Mass migration by boat, by foot, by air ensued nonetheless. In the midst of this major transformation, there emerged a dozen Ponzi schemes locally referred to as firma piramidale or pyramid firm. So you'll hear me use this term a lot. 
Uh, pyramid farms were a mix of classic Ponzi schemes whereby money circulates from new investors to early investors and joint stock companies that are run, they run on a Ponzi finance model. That is, um, you know, investment firms that, that are promising future returns that are not based on sustainable uh, patterns of wealth ac accumulation. These firms had an ambiguous status. They were half formal, half informal. Um, all of them were legally registered at the time. This is an important thing to remember. And they were re registered as other company or fondazione, companies such as Vefa and Camberi, which adds you see at the bottom of the slide, um, are, were registered as limited liability companies and had investment in tourism, retail, real estate, construction, agriculture. And they constantly featured these uh, assets in their ads that were um, printed routinely in major newspapers at the time. Fondazione or charity foundations uh, had no assets um, or investments to their name. They had a lot of um, popular followings and they con conducted a pure type of Ponzi scheme, circulating money from recent to earlier investors. And one of the, the, the top ad here is from one of the Fondazione, Fondazione Popoli. The earlier firms, Vefa and Sude, were established in 1993. By late 1996, there were a dozen of these firms and about 1.5 million investors of, or half of the country's population is estimated to have invested in the firms at the time. When they collapsed in early 97, the country fell into anarchy in a near civil war. The initial protests were by former investors who were duped by the firms and who, tuned, who turned to the uh, government to demand their money. There were, of course, other political reasons for the protests, and the sitting government at the time had lost legitimacy for a number of reasons that I can explain in, in the Q&A. Uh, but it was this violence and anarchy of the protest that caught media attention. Images of enraged, um, threatening Albanians flooded global media front pages. This uh, event was portrayed as irrational exuberance and ignorance of capitalism. Needless to say, such representations reinforced Orientalist representations of Albania and the Balkans um, as made up of irrational, hot blooded people. Um, these representations circulated locally and globally. In my book, I challenge these representations and the view that the pyramid schemes were operating outside the workings of legitimate capitalist institutions. Instead, I situate the rise of the firms at the intersections of two historical trajectories. On one hand, the longer history of speculative bubbles in capitalist economies, and on the other hand, the specific free market transformations of early 1990s Albania. I show how the firms were made possible by global and local transformations, including the transformation from a command economy to a free market economy, um, and Albanians, uh, the Albanian government's eager embrace of shock therapy reforms, and importantly, the emergence of a transnational remittance economy. So given the peculiarity of Albanians' communism and post-communism, I trace how the country's marginality was structured by the broader regional economic and political transformations of the end of the 20th century. Finally, I take this instance of financial speculation as a good case study for thinking more broadly about the economic crisis and speculative finance in the context of neoliberal economy in post-communist Albania and globally. So I mentioned that this book takes an anthropological approach to speculative forms of finance. So what does this mean? How do I do this? Specifically, the book addresses broader questions about how people from various walks of life get drawn to speculative Ponzi schemes. And this is questions that are universal. It also traces how participants viewed the pyramid firms in Albania, how they came to trust these firms with their cash um, what were their broader aspirations in terms of what they plan to do with their expected gains? These questions led me to examine the discourses of capitalism that legitimized the firms. I relied primarily on archival resources to identify these discourses and to analyze the different representations of the firms in media and public debate. A second set of concerns relate to the materiality, sociality, and temporality of financial speculation. In my research and oral narratives from former investors, 
I looked into the forms of wealth that circulated through the firms, the economic repertoires, um, both capitalist and non-capitalist, that were mobilized by the firms. I looked into other economies that the firms enabled as well. And more specifically, I trace the circulation of remittances in multiple currencies, um, privatization vouchers, and housing as different objects of value that circulated through the firms. So in the following, I lay out my argument of the book, I sum it up by focusing on three parts, focus on discourses of speculation, materialities and socialities of speculation, and temporalities of speculation. So let me start with discourses of speculation. To understand why people um, trusted these firms, I looked into representations of the firms in official and popular discourse. I looked into the archives of several newspapers, noted numerous political speeches, um, some government documents, and looked at the legal framings of the firms at the time of their boom. Looking at these representations before and after their collapse, I paid close attention to the connotations of various terms that were used to reform refer to the firms and their activities. So one key finding of this research was that the firms were considered legal and legitimate at the time of their boom. There was official legal framing, such as um, the credit contracts, is the one, one example shared here, which were signed in the presence of a notary public and which um, cited the new civil code of Albania at the time. And so that was a way in, in which a lot of the, the uh, uh, investors in the firms um, told me that they believed the firms were legitimate. There were also political statements by main leaders um, that many of the investors referred to as a source of the credibility and legitimacy of the firms. So these findings speak more broadly to the anthropology of financial speculation, which looks at the socio-legal infrastructures that make speculation possible and legitimate in any given point in time and space. Another important finding in my research was that discourses around the firms changed dramatically before and after their class. And again, this resonates with a sort of similar pattern of representations of speculative bubbles everywhere. So more specifically, I noted a highly gendered and ethnicized discourse that sought to legitimize, legitimize some and delegitimize some other firms. The firm's leaders were represented as masculine entrepreneurs at the time of the firm's boom, and they were feminized at the time of their class. Political economist Marie de Gaude notes in writing about the genealogy of European finance that finance as a profession has historically gained respectability when associated with more masculine traits. Um, representations of the firms and their owners infused these global entrepreneurial subjectivities with more culturally and historically specific types of masculinity. So here I'm approaching masculinity as not, not as a sort of a universal notion, but as a notion that is culturally and historically specific. So the firm's leaders imparted some of the traits of what Catherine Verdery describes uh, as entrepreneurs. These were individuals who had managerial positions under the communist regime. They were in charge of state resources so, which was not their ownership, but they often use their access to these resources for personal gain or to accumulate political and social capital. They acted as big chiefs using indebting generosity to accumulate power and wealth. And a number of the Albanian firms owners too had occupied similar positions during communism. For instance, Vebia Limuchai, who's uh, the head of Befa, one of the, the biggest firms and the most uh, well established in terms of having other investments. So the Avebi uh, Alimuchai is at the corner of this ad here, um, was a warehouse manager during the communist times and used many of his connections to the government as well as um, individuals and, and his so, so social capital to establish his firm. In my interviews with former investors, many were still loyal to Befa and to Alimuchai. A former manager of Befa described Alimuchai as a generous man with a big heart and a man from Kurveleshi, which is a highlands region in Vlora. It's famous for its honor system and sort of very manly culture. In these portrayals, Alimuchai was represented as a man of honor who gave his wealth to Befa's investors. 
accolades of Alimuchai indicate how notions of masculinity attached to the traditional honor code and to common structures of power and wealth were translated into the discursive field that framed post-communist entrepreneurship. These persistent cultural representations of masculinity and entrepreneurship bestowed legitimacy to Alimucha and Befa. And I should say that these, this type of entrepreneurial um, a man has persisted also beyond the, the firms. By contrast, the story of Maksude Kadona, the head of the Fondation Sude, represents the feminization and ethnicization of pyramid firms. Most international media accounts of the spectacular collapse of the firms uh, in 1997 center on the story of Maksude Kadona. A former worker in a communist shoe factory, Kadona was the first to set up a firm and the first to fold. Uh, Sude, which is the company's name, the firm's name, um, was a pure Ponzi scheme. There's no doubt about it. No investments uh, in other areas of the economy. But her financial operation was not unlike that of Befa and the other firms. When it collapsed in 1997, protests ensued. Kaduna captured global media headlines as, quote, a gypsy fortune teller who claimed to look into a crystal ball. This is from New York Times in 1997. So these de depictions of Kaduna were legion in Albania as well. But I found through my research that this was only the case after the collapse of the firms. Media records before the collapse reported testimonies of investors who were former shoe factory workers and who trusted Kaduna, given that she used to run a rotating uh, credit circle uh, called Lotari in the factory during the communist times. So representations of Kaduna post collapse are written in grotesque remarks about her gender and ethnicity. Sude was thus delegitimized um, through depictions of Kaduna as a fickle and fraudulent Roma girl. This depiction reflects a discourse of sexism and prejudice against the Roma and Egyptian communities in Albania. In the aftermath of the collapse of Sude, um, it became an icon of fraudulent speculative finance and her name is still used to this day in public discourse as a way to delegitimize other economic activities. Depictions of Kadona as a gypsy fortune teller with a crystal ball replicate the tropes of unpredictable, emotional and hysterical behavior associated with speculative and fraudulent finance. The shift in register from the powerful and honorable bosses to the fickle and hysterical gypsy fortune teller represents a familiar discursive practice in the history of capitalism. So again, as the Goad notes, delusions and hysteria are the most salient and durable metaphors of crisis. Taken together, then these discourses of entrepreneurship and of speculative finance serve simultaneously to legitimize certain policies and institutions um, while framing the failings of these institutions and practices as externalities, speculative bubbles, mania. So having deconstructed the discourses of speculation, I then turn to practices of wealth accumulation value conversion that took place through the firms. One recurring theme in my conversations with former investors to the firms was the ubiquity and abundance of cash in circulation at the time. These accounts of abundance were perplexing to me given the multiple currency devaluations, rising unemployment, economic dispossession that was going on at the time. These accounts of abundance contrast with stories of virtual or illusory wealth that allegedly fueled the madness of the crowds in uh, a case of a speculative bubble. They underscore the materiality of financial speculation. So in the book, I note two specific pathways of wealth circulation and conversion that enabled and was facilitated by the firms. On the one hand, I discuss the top-down processes of privatization as a pathway of value conversion that generated a bifurcated path of dispossession for a few, for, some, for many and accumulation for a few. On the other hand, I explore the bottom-up monetary repertoires of remittances and multiple currencies that flow through the firms. So the top-down um, process of value conversion is quite similar to the processes that, again, are described in Catherine Bordery's chapter on the uh, Romanian pyramid scheme, Caritas. Privatization of state property in across uh, the Eastern Europe provided opportunities for entrepreneurs to buy property at very low cost. 
Meanwhile, a system of distribution of shares in state enterprises through privatization vouchers or bono privatizzini in Albania, again, benefited the enterprises or the, the people that had been associated with the regime. Um, because it enabled they were more in the know of when these properties were going to, to public auction. And the other part of this is so privatization vouchers were used in different countries and, and they were used differently. Um, in some countries of Eastern Europe, they were just given to their own employees and they were supposed to be just used to purchase uh, these uh, private, privatized uh, entities. In some countries, including Albania, these vouchers were also convertible to, to money. They had a, a market value. And what happened in Albania is that the nominal value that you see printed on the, these vouchers in, very quickly was devalued uh, because of the way that it circulated in the informal currency exchanges. And so a lot of people who had nothing else, they just sold them at 10% of their nominal value. And or less. So the other pathway of value conversion that I researched was that of migrant remittances deposited to the firms. This was a bottom-up financial repertoire that proliferated outside the banking system and was mediated by social networks among migrants. By tracing the circulation of remittances from migrants to kin to the firms, I discussed the materialities and socialities of financial speculation. I first realized the extent of the use of multiple currencies through the firms when Durin presented me with a ledger he had kept when working as a sexer or a broker for the firm Jalita. Durin um, was an army officer during communism. He was laid off in the early 90s. He moved back to Vlora, which was his place of origin. And he had worked there in the span of four to five years. Uh, he had gone from working in the farmer's market to being money changer to then becoming a broker for the firms. So this kind of shows you uh, the, the, the life-changing circumstances of the 90s and how people moved, were very un unstable, had very unstable job uh, prospects, and they were looking for something to give them, provide them some security. So I met Durim in Vlora in 2008 where at the time he worked as a security guard at an internet cafe. Durim shared his own ledger where he listed the investor who, investors who had deposited money through the, to the firms through him. One of my first observations about this ledger was that most of the investors shared the last name with Durim. And I, I have modeled this in the photo because I, for protection of privacy, but you can take my word that these were all Durim's relatives. So they were his kin, and indeed social networks among king and among investors and brokers played a crucial role in how the firms uh, recruited people. This is very widespread practice. Now, this scenario perhaps is a little bit more extreme in Albania, but it's not unlike other sites of pyramid schemes or money marketing schemes, where fraudulent firms mobilize social networks to draw more investors. So for instance, we recently, Bernie Madoff passed away, and we know that Bernie Madoff's scheme also used networks of friends and family members um, to, to draw as investors over a long period of time. Social norms of reciprocity, obligation, and trust mediated the transfer of remittances to the firms. But the collapse of the firms also had a significant impact on restructuring social relations. So relations between generations were reconfigured after the firms collapsed. And the brokers, whether they were close relatives, or distant acquaintances received a lot of blame and hostility from investors. So overall, uh, in the book, I point out how these dynamics point to speak to the intertwined relationship between money and social ties uh, that undergird financial speculation, but, but other uh, um, economic activities as well. The second observation of, from the ledger um, is that the ledger has different columns for different currencies. So going from left to right, we have the Albanian lac, the US dollar, the Greek drachma, the Italian lira, and the German mark. Um, this list then contains a record of the earmarking of different currencies um, as they relate to migration patterns in early 90s Albania. Migrants sent their remittances in the currencies of their host countries, and also this is a time before the Europe. 
right? So we have multiple countries. Drachma from Greece, the country where most of the uh, migrants were at the time. Lira from Italy, uh, the second uh, most number of migrants, and then followed by currencies from other European countries and, and the United States. The emerging, uh, and you can see here that the drachma is the second most populated column. Um, and one of the things that, I mean, there's a lot of things that I can draw from this uh, vignette, but one of the things, uh, one of the, the um, uh, facts that we can read through this is that the, the firms um, accepted deposits in these different currencies and they also gave back interest in these different currencies. And this was something that the banks weren't doing at the time. So the emerging cash economy and the flow of remittances in multiple currencies were a key form of wealth channeled through the firms. Attention to these bottom-up practices brings forth a more complex picture of financial speculation in neoliberal times. Among other things, um, these practices underscore the mutual imbrication of formal and informal economies, the multiple entanglements of capitalist economies with other uh, logics and practices accumu of accumulation such as remittances, and the new monetary repertoires and practices that emerge at the in interstices of these logics. They also underscore how financial speculation can take hold through highly personalized transaction rather than abstraction of capital. Further, as I explained towards the end of the book, migration and remittances continue, um, constitute an undoing economy that continues to play a crucial role as a buffer to ongoing economic instability and crisis in the region. Um, for many former investors, the booms and busts of the firms were also, had also uh, changed their individual life trajectories. Many described the collapse of the firms as a lagging behind from their anticipated trajectories. Discussions of temporality of finance and life were often expressed by investors as they expressed their plans and their decisions to participate in the firms and the ensuing consequences of the firm's collapse on their life trajectories. One such discussion of temporality often emerged in discussions around um, of tales of, of housing sales and purchases. In addition to remittances, um, another widespread practice of the 90s was selling off the recently privatized apartment or house for cash to deposit in the firms. This phenomenon took place in the aftermath of a massive privatization reform that tr transformed state-owned housing into private property. With the major shift of the housing regime from a state-owned regime to real estate market, many residents with no other sources of wealth became owners of small apartments, and this was their only for, uh, form of wealth. But as these were small and deteriorating apartments or houses, the owners wanted to move to or to build better housing. In 1996, many rushed to sell these apartments for cash, deposit the cash into the firms, and hoped to double or triple the amount in six months to a year. And then they wanted to buy a new house. <laughs> and this was ubiquitous across the board. Everyone I interviewed, um, uh, that's what their plan was. So one of my informants I'm going to share, one, one little story here, uh, Magnolia had gone so far as to demolish her communist era house in the village of Narta. So this was not an apartment, this is a house. And this is actually not her house um, because she demolished hers, but this is an example of the kind of house that she demolished, which is the, the house in the front. So Magnolia and her husband had worked as migrant, uh, migrants in Greece for four years. Therefore, their whole families were in Greece and they continue to be in Greece. They themselves had returned uh, in around 96 to take care of their parents, uh, according to Albanian traditions, the younger son supposed to take care of their parents. So this is very common, but all of their family remained abroad and they're, they're, they deposit their savings in Befa and Jalita. And actually Magnolia also coordinated their remittances from other family members, depositing them into the firms. So again, she said she planned to, to build a new house. And she says, I demolished our house. She was very regretful of this. We had an El Basanche house, two bedrooms and a hallway. My father-in-law had built it in the 60s. We had a strong desire to make a new house. That's all the Albanians wanted then, a beautiful European house. El Basanche house refers to the house that her father-in-law had built in the 60s, 
following one of the few approved plans by the Tirana Institute of Design. In the original design, these houses were a significant improvement over the Ottoman style houses, which were built in mud bricks and outdoor bathrooms by incorporating modern European styles such as bricks and indoor plumbing system. So the, the house in the front here is a kind of house that, that was built, the Elba Sanche house. So as such, the Elba Sanche house represented a communist modernity in the 60s. This was even more so the case with the communist apartments in the cities. By the late 80s, however, the Elba Sanche house and the communist apartment uh, embodied a fair modernity that many were eager to leave behind. Magnola's plans uh, was to build a European house, such as the one in the back of the slide, um, which would be a house with more bedrooms, more balconies, a French as opposed to a Turkish bathroom, multiple floors, etc. And actually, uh, walking around Narta, everyone had done this in this town, right? They had used remittance money or pyramid scheme money to build uh, a, a sort of a European style house or what is called European style house. For other investors um, who had sold their urban communist apartments, their hopes was to relocate closer to the center of the cities, which were also the more European, especially in the case of Tirana. Sadly, Magnola had also lost her migrant savings to the firms. She described the horrible years uh, following the collapse of the firms where she had to scramble until she was able to regain to, to build, uh, rebuild her new home. And then this was actually thanks to the continuous remittances that her family members were sending her, but this took much longer than it would have taken if she had gotten back her, her gains from the firms. So Magnola's and other stories of loss of a home speak to desired, failed, and actual tempor temporalities of life and finance that intertwined with investors' decisions to participate in the firms. On the one hand, by promising multiple gains, the firms provided a pathway for an accelerated temporality of wealth accumulation. This was highly desired given the unpredictable temporalities of life in the post-communist context. Um, but ultimately, by looking at how housing played a role in investors' decisions to participate in the firms, in the book I know the importance of aspirations and horizons of expectations, that shapes faculty forms of finance. Finally, to wrap it up, the book also brings this experience of the 90s to reflect on the enduring aspects of pyramid firms into the present. And I identify in the book three instances of continuity or parallel to the different um, economies and logics that I identified earlier. So one is the speculative economic logics of the firms um, are replicated in other contemporary financial practices. In the book, I discuss the example of construction financing, which is also similarly speculative, non-bank, uh, social network driven model of financing. Second, I talked about uh, in the book, in the earlier part of the presentation, I talked about how investors sought to access different regimes of value, such as remittances or privatization vouchers, as a way to hedge risk and uncertainty. So this modality of wealth accumulation through by accessing multiple regions of value, I argue continues to be prevalent in Albania as does the remittance economy, which uh, provides access to other currencies, value regimes and, and some economic security. And third, aspirations towards a European political and cultural belonging are also prevalent in Albanian discourse. These aspirations are political in that they aspire towards EU accession, but they're also cultural in that people continue to aspire to this uh, being included or um, as part of European history and culture. Finally, in exploring these continuities, the book emphasizes the Albanian peculiarity, such as the specific forms of communism and post-communism that took their, um, their relationship to Europe, the migration patterns, it also emphasizes the global resonances of the Albanian case, specifically the neoliberal logics of accumulation, the temporalities of the punctuated present, the aspirations towards alternative modernities, and the intertwining of neoliberal economies and non-capitalist economies, such as those of kinship and migration. With all of that said, I hope that the book will speak to Albanianists, Balkanists, 
anthropologists and scholars of finance alike. Thank you, and I'm happy to take questions. Great. Thank you. So you've covered so much ground, and I think that's, that's one of the really fascinating things about your research is, you know, through this story of this episode, you, you know, you take it in so many different directions, and especially sort of thinking with the housing at the end and just the materiality of, of, of life. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about, I, I like this sort of framework, you know, now that we, we, we look back on it, you know, the immediate sort of reaction tends to be one of just, you know, bemusement and shock, like, oh, how could anyone ever think that you were going to get a million dollars back, right? Or that, um, you know, it was too good or be true, or how could you risk your life savings or buildings or something and something that was just so obviously, you know, uh, uh, a Ponzi scheme. And, and, and what I think I really, what I really appreciate about your work is, is taking us through that way of, of, of thinking in this environment where all these kind of visual inputs and signifiers of, you know, wealth and missing out and Europeanization are giving you cues in the other direction. So I'm just wondering, um, you know, has, you know, you're looking back on it now in the country itself, um, what, what kinds of reckonings have there been with, 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 with the schema? Is this sort of an episode that is kind of just kind of buried? Is it still taboo to talk about? Um, I'm, I'm curious, you have revisited this in a very fascinating, responsible way, um, but how, do, how is Albania re-narrating this uh, and viewing this, this period? So well, one of the things that I was worried about when I was researching the topic was that people were going to be too sensitive to talk about it because I, I knew that a lot of people had lost money. Yeah. I knew that there were, I thought or expected people to be sort of ashamed of it. Right. But actually I was uh, wrong. <laughs> people were very eager, very comfortable talking about it. Some of them found it amusing. Part of it I think was because it was a decade later and even people who had lost a lot of money or had lost their housing had, had found other ways of recovering. Only once did I have someone who refused to even talk about it because he was very sore. Um, so part of it, I think, is Albanians have gone through these ups and downs and, and this the state of uncertainty and loss has become very normalized. And so people are not uncomfortable talking about the pyramid schemes. I think also, so what happened after the pyramid scheme collapsed, there was this year of anarchy and violence, and then the government eventually uh, resigned. The president resigned. There was an international peace force uh, led by Italian troops that came in, and there was a new government. There were all these international organizations that came in to help with auditing. So, so it was something that was talked about a lot. It wasn't like repressed. Um, I think interestingly, the new generation, this is what I found very fascinating, even the young people, right? Like the kids of the people that I interviewed, they didn't want to talk about it because they just thought it was like a stupid, it was like, how could you be so stupid, right? Um, so there was, there was that, there was definitely a generational uh, distance, but it comes back in the, in, so it, well, the other thing I should say is that there's four books in Albanian that have been published about the schemes and about the, the events of 97. And they mostly focus on the political story and the political actors and the schemes are sort of on the background and they're all written by people who are really involved in the politics of the time so they're really important useful memoirs um so in that sense there has been writing about it but i think what they hasn't been this is what i wanted to do with my work is that there hasn't been a lot of um, you know this kind of work of interviewing people who participated or talking about their life stories, right? So that hasn't been so much talked about, not as much, for instance, as let's say um, the memory of communism is being now really explored, you know, and, and and talked about in a lot of mediums. So maybe this is something that will come in the future. Um, I recently found out something that I should have known in the past, but I didn't. 
that there were some actually interesting artistic works that engage with this time. Um, so I was like, oh man, I missed that, you know, during my research. But so, so there has been different kinds of engagements. One thing though, so there, there isn't a repression, but there is definitely a sort of lack of analysis, I would say, of socio-cultural, even economic analysis. Um, even economic analysis I find is very uh, simplistic. And part of it is because people, for instance, in the Ministry of Finance, I went to look for some material and I found really important documents, but they just kept saying, we don't have any documents because these were outside of, they were kind of ashamed of it, right? So they were like, this were outside of the formal system. They were not our responsibility, right? So it's that, that attitude of not wanting to know it and not wanting to sort of explore how it connected with other things. So I'm hoping to bring some of those stories uh, into, into light. Yeah, no, that's, that's super interesting. Um, okay, let's take a couple of questions. Uh, the Q&A tab is open. First one is from Paula Ganga, who is uh, one of our Harriman postdocs uh, here in residence, and she's a political economist. And she writes, this overview of the evolution of the situation in Albania is fascinating. Similar dynamics were at play in other European countries. I'm more familiar with the Romanian scheme, uh, Caritas, which you mentioned, as well as FNI. Can you speak to the similarities and differences in these types of scandals across the region? Um, <laughs> and then she asks about uh, the role of state security services, criminal organizations. Uh, and then she's got a whole bunch of questions. Let's do those two. Uh, and then uh, questions about prosecutions and justice for these schemes okay. um, where yeah. one held accountable. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. And, and these are great questions. I, I address a lot of them in the book um, with more detail. So definitely there is a lot of similarities with other schemes in the region, which kind of speaks to how these schemes were sort of emerged out of the, the particular kinds of economic transformations that were happening at the time and the gaps in, in the, econo the new economic institutions, the lack of um, access to banking by people. So, so the schemes, for instance, this is one of my arguments is that they, they provided an alternative banking uh, system for a lot of people who couldn't, for instance, take a loan from a commercial bank in Albania. This was a little bit more extreme in Albania because Albania had a very, very um, strong ban on private property and on private money and interest and all that. I think, so I mentioned the, the, the sort of resonance with the case that Catherine Bordery has talked about, and she's talked about the um, connections with the old regime and with the, the entrepreneurs. And I, I, I mentioned that that is a case. At the same time, there's other cases that are not similar or they're different. They're different characteristics than the Romanian one. For one thing, in Romania, there was one, right, this Caritas, and it was really very strongly connected with the government. The Albanian ones were also connected with the government, but not, not in the same way. Right, so in Albania, you actually at that time you actually had a different regime. It was a, the opposition party. This was supposed to be a, a great thing. There was a democratic party, which was the first opposition party, and was supposed to break the ties with the communist regime. But I explained that there was there was a continuity insofar as some of the leaders of the schemes had been entrepreneurs during communism. So they had this. It was more like social networks and social knowledge. The other way that the government connected to the schemes is that it supported them. It um, legitimized them in public, even when the IMF came and said these are illegitimate or they're, they're fraudulent schemes, the president said, no, these are Albanian informal but national capitalists, right? So that was that connection. But then there were other people like Sude example is one, which she was not at all connected with the nomenclatura or with uh, this leaders of uh, enterprises. She was someone who was running these lotteries that, that are not lotteries, they're more like rotating credit associations. And so she had the social network and so she started this scheme, right? So, so there are differences as well. I think the other major difference from other schemes in the region is the scale. The scale yeah. of the ones in Albania was so big that it really, I mean, it, it collapsed the whole economy and so that was not the case in Romania. That was not the case in Russia with the MMM scheme and other places. So I think that was, that's, a, that's why what makes this thing so significant. 
Connections to the criminal organizations, there's a lot of allegations to this, and I think they're true, especially there is at this time um, a lot of uh, trafficking of diesel and, and arms. To there's a, there's a conflict going on in former Yugoslavia. Uh, but as an anthropologist, I could not have access to those connect. I, I cannot speak to them. I could not uh, investigate them, especially not a decade later. There's no paper trail, right? So. I know that there, there's allegations, and I'm sure that there is some of that contributed to the schemes or, or profited from the schemes. But what I wanted to look at was these other uh, economies that were, um, they may be informal, but they're pretty legitimate, like the remittances and economies and how those were also integrated with the schemes. And in terms of prosecution, yes, there were prosecutions of the, everyone who was a leader of the scheme. Some of them went into exile, so they escaped prosecution. A couple of them went, uh, Sude, I always tell the story now, is the, the first one to uh, surrender. <laughs> she was actually the most honest one, even though she's, made, she's ridiculed because she actually uh, admitted, she's like, I was running a Ponzi scheme and she, she did it, she served her term and, her term was shortened because of her cooperation. And Ali Muchai, who I also mentioned in the presentation, was also uh, tried and imprisoned. And when I was doing my research, he was still in prison. Um, um, perfect. So let's uh, move on to a question from uh, Tika Vera. You've already touched on this, but she wants to ask specifically about the responsibility of the political class on the establishment of the Ponzi schemes. So, um, so like I mentioned, I think the political regime at the time had a really important role in legitimizing the firms. And so this is one of the things that I ex explore in chapter one. Um, and they did so by, through these public statements. Uh, the firms also funded uh, political campaigns and ads of some of the the political parties. Now, I should say that in the aftermath, the main blame was put on the president, Sali Berisha, who was also the, the sort of main figure of the Democratic Party, and rightfully so, because he really went out to support these firms when these international institutions didn't. And actually, he broke ties with international institutions over these, how he handled this, this uh, situation. But at the same time, and this is what I learned through my, my research too, that my informants informed me that uh, politicians from all sides of the political spectrum had either invested in the firms or uh, gotten money for their, their political campaigns. And actually, so when the firm started to collapse, what happens is that people that had connections, they started to withdraw their money while other people couldn't because the firms froze the assets. So the allegations are that a lot of the politicians from all sides of the spectrum who had invested in the firms they were able to take the money out um, before other people. So they didn't lose. So, that, so there is a, a really big responsibility um, for, for reasons that are beyond me, my knowledge. Um, for instance, the, the, the president of the Albania was not prosecuted about this or any of the politicians. There was a, there was a, um, like a um, task force that was established. There were a couple of institutions that were established in the aftermath that were supposed to do the investigations and do um, the distribution of money because some of these firms had assets, but they didn't touch the political parties. And part of it, I think is, 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 is sort of the problem that Albania is facing right now is there's this long history of impunity um, of various politicians so, so unfortunately, this is one of the things that I sort of suggest is that one of the problems was that by vilifying Sude, right, you're leaving out all these other actors that also helped Sude become Sude or Ali Mucha become Ali Mucha. So that process has not, it did not happen. It's not happening. <laughs> I don't think it's going to happen. And those politicians are still in, in you know, they're still active. Berisha actually came back to power after five years after or, or more so so i mean yeah i think one of the other fascinating um extensions that you draw and you mention also in your talk is the kind of the temporality 
um, dimension. And that's something we normally don't think about from a political economy perspective. I mean, we, you know, there were debates about shock therapy versus gradualism and, and so forth, you know, in this sense. But what, what I really like is how you draw this comparison between the regularity of communism and the predictability of communism and then this new, <laughs> you know, unknown sort of temporal space. And I'm wondering whether, you know, you talked about it in the context of, of, um, of, of, of lifestyle and, and the housing and so forth, but i um, wondering if you could say a little bit more about that. Like, how did you start thinking about this idea of temporality and its centrality into formulating um, these, these expectations around the schemes? Yeah, thank you. That was the part that I cut out because oh, okay. I realized that this was going to go over a little bit too long. But it was something that also has come to me more through the process of writing rather than when I was doing my research. It wasn't it wasn't a question that I had asked. And part of it is that my thinking about temporality is being influenced by this anthropology of finance, which which is bringing light to that. And I think I find it fascinating to sort of look at how temporalities of finance intertwine with temporalities of life, right? So when I talk about temporality, I, I'm thinking about it in two ways. On one level, it's the temporality um, that you're talking about, which is this the rhythm of life. So for instance, so like you said, uh, and people have been studying this a lot um, during communism, just like Fordism, right? It's, there's a similarity in those two period, in those two economic systems where you have a regularity. You know, you, you have a sense that you're gonna have a paycheck, on a regular basis, you're gonna have some benefits. In the Albanian case, you had, um, you know, it was scarcity, there was very few products, but you have the sense of, of regular things that are coming to you. You had, um, you know, I mean, like I said, everyone, there was full employment policy. So even though it was very poor country and there was a lot of other political problems um, with repression, I think that that sense of regularity was completely disrupted, right, with the post-communist changes. And so in the 90s, so this is something that I'm, I'm sort of like, I, I was thinking about it as I was writing that the chapter about temporality, it, it's to try to think about the 90s. I lived in Albania in the 90s, I left in 95. And so I remember this as a teenager of how these things got disrupted and it's hard to make sense of it at the moment, but basically um, people lost their job right their regular their state jobs which means people were doing all kinds of jobs but they're irregular unpredictable uh, and this was across the board you could never rely on anything for more than a few months right so so this is what Jane Geyer calls the punctuated presence which and she writes about neoliberal times she doesn't write about post-socialist context but it really captures very well for me the temporalities of life that people were experiencing. So now people that went to migration, right, were expecting that they were gonna get rich very quickly. And they discovered that yes, they were able to send money back, but it took a really long time and a lot of suffering. And so what I discovered, what I think the pyramid schemes provided for those people was a, uh, it provided the promise that you could accelerate this long years of migration, you could accelerate that. And instead of spending 10 years in migration, you could spend three years, bring your money back in, multiply, and then start your normal life. The other thing that I noticed in my interviews was that sometimes people were using the interest, were taking out the interest as if it was a salary because they didn't have more salary. So they would not pull the whole thing out. They would just get like the 30, 10% interest. And it was like, at least it was a regular income. It was small. And so I thought that that was a way, an attempt for people to recreate this temporality of welfare or like whatever Keynesian type of economy, right? So anyway, so that's one aspect of this. The other aspect of how I talk about temporality it relates more to cultural imaginaries of how people think they're part of a sp specific temporal system. So this uh, with the housing, what I thought was really, so anyway, actually housing was another important piece of changing these temporalities because housing gives you more durability, durable wealth. So I saw that as an effort for people to sort of um, change their trajectories. But then there was this added aspect when people, when Magnola talks about European house, which is that people also felt they were left behind, right? behind what? And so the, the point of reference for Albanians is Europe. Europe is sort of this 
horizon of the future where people want to be. And it's, it's, it's both a horizon of the future, like this is where we want to be, we want to go there and we're going to go there faster by, by you know, the schemes. But then there's also this other temporal, timeless temporality where people claim that there were always, Albania was always European, European culture before it was invaded by Ottoman Empire, right? So it's kind of this interesting juncture of these different temporalities expressed in people's aspirations, right? What has their, uh, uh, participating in the schemes. And, and some and these things are actually persistent to the day, like both the insecurity is persistent, remittances as a sort of wealth is persistent, and desires for Europeanness are persistent. Very good. Well, um, we are out of time, but I just want to thank you for giving this really amazing talk. Good luck with the book. Uh, thank you. And, and, thank you all for having me. And uh, yeah, absolutely. I hope uh, I hope you come back again and 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 talk about some of your other uh, absolutely fascinating research. I would love to. Thank you all. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye.